Hello, it's uh, Zach Kilpatrick. I'm your guest lecturer for today. We're going to talk about homogenization and averaging, um, in particular applied to a uh, traveling wave problem in the bistable equation. Uh, this is based on uh, previous work by Jim Keener, uh, but really building on uh, decades of work on on averaging and uh, homogenization in spatial and temporal systems. So um, the first line of figures here you see is um, the typical time lapse of uh, traveling wave propagation in something like the bistable equation, where you have uh, an invariant uh, traveling front profile that uh, simply moves to the right uh, at some speed c. And uh, the image on the top right is uh, just a spatiotemporal plot where the warmer colors show the invasion of the front from left to right. If we add some heterogeneity to a system like this, uh, for instance, making the diffusion coefficient in, a, say, a reaction diffusion model uh, periodically inhomogeneous, what you see, first of all, is that the a uh, trailing edge now has these uh, periodic ripples on it. Um, and in uh, addition, the wave sort of uh, lurches, so uh, moves a bit faster when the diffusion's higher and slower when the diffusion's lower. And you can see these sort of ripples in the bottom right uh, color plot in space-time. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that the wave is still um, translation invariant uh, up to discrete shifts. So if you shift by, uh, let's say, t star, which would be the, the period of time that it takes to get through the spatial uh, inhomogeneity, then the, uh, the traveling front profile looks uh, the same at those points. Okay, But in between, you have this uh, sort of lurching behavior evidenced by the, the color plot. So um, there's a lot of things that you could describe in detail about uh, wave propagation in these problems. Uh, we're going to tackle uh, just one of those today, which is estimating the speed of the uh, resulting wave, which is not exactly a traveling wave uh, because it's not going to be translation invariant, uh, but how the, the wave speed is, is slowed uh, by the introduction of inhomogeneities. And we're going to use a uh, uh, homogenization technique, which is not just going to be classical averaging. We'll talk about why classical averaging uh, might fail in this case. And this is all based on a paper by uh, Jim Keener from the year 2000 in Physica D, uh, looking at the impact of heterogeneity on uh, nonlinear waves. And not only um, can heterogeneity slow waves, it can also just lead to, to pinning of waves, essentially where a front slows to a stop, and uh, you just have sort of the standing, standing front profile solution. So he works out in that in this paper. We're mostly going to look at the, the slowing problem. Okay, so this is all going to be built around uh, the bistable equation, which you would have seen in partial differential equations. This is sort of a canonical model of traveling waves. You can do this sort of analysis for other systems that generate traveling waves, and I'll pose a, a homework problem for you where you actually look at this in an integral differential equation model of uh, neural networks. And the basic idea is that you have a diffusion term on the right-hand side. We'll take its diffusion coefficient to be 1 for now. Uh, the nonlinearity uh, needs to have uh, three zeros in it. You could think of a cubic. Uh, you, you could also think of uh, well, piecewise linear dynamics, as we'll um, I'll take a look at near the end. But the, 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 the main elements you need in this function f is that it has three zeros um, and that it's uh, negative from, from zero to alpha. Uh, this generates uh, a system where waves uh, will either have the, uh, the one state, I guess, invade the, the zero state, or the zero state in, invades the one state. So depending on whether you have kind of rightward or leftward moving uh, traveling waves in this case. Um, and I, I believe you may have worked out some exercises in, in PDEs to do this, if you, if you uh, took PD, graduate PDEs with me. 
So um, how do you derive these traveling wave solutions? Well, you make a traveling wave onsets, which is to say that I'm going to look for solutions that are um, invariant with respect to this traveling wave coordinate or characteristic psi equals x minus ct. If you plug that assumption into this, uh, the, the PDE, you end up with uh, just a second order nonlinear differential equation, which you can convert to uh, a, a phase plane equation, and then um, apply some shooting methods in order to find effectively that solutions are going to have uh, a form like this, where u as a function of xi is going to be some not monotone decreasing function that connects um, an unstable fixed point in the phase plane to another unstable fixed point in the phase plane. So it connects two saddles together. And this, this is called a header clinic. It, it, it shoots from the, the one state to the, the zero state. And so uh, in this case, if C is greater than zero, then you have the, the up state, or U equals one in, invades the down state, U equals zero. As I said, this is a heteroclinic, which just means that it's a curve that um, connects two different fixed points in the, in the phase plane. I mean, because of this, it's not structurally stable, uh, which is actually one of the assumptions that you need to use sort of standard uh, averaging. So we'll, we'll see, because of that, that we have to stretch beyond what's called the standard averaging theorem, which I'll introduce, and then we'll pivot and use something slightly different. So that's the homogeneous uh, by stable equation wave problem. Um, but what we're going to talk about is heterogeneity, or sometimes we might call this inhomogeneity. What is the effect of introducing inhomogeneity maybe into the uh, diffusion coefficients or the, or the form of the nonlinearity? And biological and physical systems uh, abound with these sorts of heterogeneities. Um, it can happen because you have inhomogeneous porosity of, uh, of media. Uh, that you're studying, uh, maybe heat is conducted differently in different parts of the medium, uh, maybe elect electrical current is conducted differently. This sort of thing happens in uh, networks of cardiac cells, which is really the, the motivation for, for Keener's study, in that if you model just a line of cardiac cells, the way that electrical current is propagated across the gap junctions or connections between cardiac cells is different um, than how it's uh, conducted within a single cardiac cell. So the conductivity varies in this, in this inhomogeneous way. And we want to ask how to model this. So there's a very general form that we can use for um, a periodic inhomogeneity of the diffusion coefficient of the, the bistable equation. And uh, this particular form uh, it makes just the explicit analysis a little bit more amenable. Uh, you, you, you could take different forms, but the basic idea is that uh, you're going to divide the, 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 the baseline homogeneous diffusion coefficient by 1 plus g prime of x over epsilon, where g prime of x over epsilon is going to be some periodic function. Okay, represented here on the left is something like a sinusoid, that is mean uh, zero, and epsilon is small, as it, as it always is, as you've probably encountered uh, mostly in this class. And um, it's, it's periodic, so then, with, with a period of, of 2 pi epsilon. So the smaller epsilon is, the more rapid these oscillations go. And the idea is that this microscale is small enough that the... Um, the its effects can sort of be smoothed over um, when you look at uh, grosser uh, features of the of the model, like this, the approximate speed of of waves. And so, um, if if epsilon becomes wider and wider, um, then that's going to start to break the general form of a standard uh, traveling front, right? Because you no longer uh, will have anything that even behaves to order zero like, like just a traveling front. And so the idea is that this microscale is small enough uh, that, we can, uh, that we can sort of approximate its effects by saying that uh, we, we have a perturbed version 
of what we'd have in, in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And as epsilon goes to zero, the oscillations become high enough that um, the, the effect is that you, you just recover the homogeneous system. Okay. So how do we handle this? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna homogenize, basically average over this um, micro scale somehow. Um, and before we get to doing that for the traveling wave problem, uh, let's just look at the simpler simpler problem here, which would be just the steady state version of uh, heat conduction in one dimension. So we've dropped the time derivative, we've dropped the reaction term, we just have a steady state heat conduction. And the question is, what's the effect of this periodically varying uh, diffusion coefficient? So um, our approach uh, to start with is to uh, separate the what's called the macro scale, which would be things on the order of x, uh, and, and the micro scale, which would be things that vary um, on the order of sigma here, x over uh, epsilon. So um, as anything, any small changes in X are going to have big changes on Sigma. So Sigma is going to detect these sort of small changes in your spatial variable. And even though these uh, two are exactly related to each other, by pulling apart the micro and the macro scale, we can pull apart at orders of epsilon hierarchy the effects of uh, the micro scale on the uh, steady state uh, the, the features of the steady state solution. So in this case, if you take the total derivative now of x, it involves both 1 over epsilon times the partial with respect to uh, sigma plus the partial with respect to y. So if we apply this then to our steady state problem, uh, we have this much more complicated form of our, um, our derivative uh, with respect to uh, x uh, and then the diffusion coefficient times the, the derivative with respect to x again. And it's separated out into um, this term that's a derivative with respect to x and a derivative with respect to uh, y. So what are we going to do with this? Uh, we're we're going to say, well, let's assume now that the effects of the microscale can be separated into um, a hierarchy of epsilon contributions to the solution u of x uh, sigma now. And at zeroth order, we'll say that the microscale has no effect. Okay? And at order epsilon, we'll say that the microscale does have an effect, and so on at, at order epsilon squared. Okay? So that's a strong assumption that uh, the microscale does not impact uh, u uh, uh, zero, and we'll explore sort of breaking that when we looked at the traveling wave problem. The other thing is that because we assume that uh, g prime has zero mean, we're also going to assume that u one and u two have zero mean as well. Okay, so this is sort of zero mean perturbation is going to uh, result in a in a zero mean. Uh, perturbation to the solution, okay? And also because G's, uh, G prime and G are periodic and sigma, so are U1 and U2, okay? So as I said, we are going to need to consider the microscale at zero third order once we go to the traveling wave problem, and we'll see the effect of not doing that now um, in the case of the steady state heat conduction problem, okay? So this is just the, uh, now the partial differential equation and the perturbation expansion that um, I, I wrote down on the previous slide. If we expand now in order epsilon to lowest order of epsilon, we also we actually have terms of order epsilon to the minus one half, right? Because you see here you have a one minus epsilon and a one minus epsilon, so you have these terms that are products of one one over one over epsilon. Sorry, one over epsilon times one over epsilon. Okay, so. Uh, what remains there is uh, this this equation here, okay? And at order epsilon to the minus one, we have this uh, more uh, complicated equation uh, regarding all the uh, cross terms in our um, partial uh, differential equation up in the top left, okay? So let's treat the order epsilon to the minus two equation first, okay? If we just integrate that with respect to sigma, 
Then the right-hand side would generate uh, just a function of, of y, because if I'm integrating with respect to uh, uh, sigma, then um, things uh, just involving a function of y, if I, if I differentiate it again, those would go away. That becomes a, a, a fairly simple sort of first order um, uh, partial differential equation, one that you might think, well, maybe I could even solve that using something like method of characteristics. We, we can, in fact, sort of solve it by hand using the, the assumptions that we've already um, taken on. And it involves both a u1 and u0, okay? Both of which, uh, so far, we don't know. k of y is just some, you know, unknown function. g, g prime, we actually know, okay? Well, first of all, we, we know that u0 is supposed to represent the average behavior. So what, what we would get by um, integrating out our, our, our solution um, over space, okay? And u1 and, and du1, dy have zero mean. So if we integrate that um, above equation over the period of the inhomogeneity, okay, then du1 d, d sigma should should integrate to zero because it has zero mean. du0 dy will not because it's not necessarily um, uh, zero mean over the, the period of the microstructure. Okay, And also we know that uh, g prime of sigma has zero mean. So if we integrate that over the, the period of uh, the, the inhomogeneity, then it should vanish, okay? So when we do that, we just have this equation, k of y equals uh, du0 dy, okay? If we plug that into the, the PDE that we started with, um, right up there, then we end up with uh, du1 d, d sigma plus du0 dy, this is equal to du0 dy. So now we've replaced k of y with, with du0 dy. And we still have our 1 plus g prime of, of uh, sigma. So when we uh, simplify this PDE now, now we just have a relationship between u1 and, uh, and u0 through g of, of sigma. So we've just integrated up with respect to uh, sigma once, and we end up with this uh, 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 fairly compact expression for u1 in terms of u0, okay? So if we plug this into um, our second equation, okay, we still don't have a solution in terms of uh, u0, but we can uh, say something about what our solution will look like. So now I'm just plugging in this expression that we derived from the first equation into our big long second equation and things collapse down nicely. Okay, so we still have this uh, du2 d, d sigma term, uh, but now we've replaced all our uh, du1 uh, dy and du1 d sigma terms using uh, the expression that we derived for u1, okay? And, um, and cancel th some things out, and we can say that this is equal to zero, okay? Now, uh, if we average this equation, again, um, anything that depends on sigma should average to zero, okay? Because everything on the order of the microstructure averages to zero over um, uh, sort of long, long wavelengths, okay? So the periodicity of g, g prime, u2 all implies that um, if, if I integrate this, I end up with um, uh, the, the first two terms are going to vanish because they involve um, g of sigma and u2 of sigma. And the only thing that is, is not going to be periodic, okay, uh, when, we, when we average over um, overall space is going to be the uh, d2u0 dy part, okay? So this is now our homogenized equation, okay? Which we could solve, it's just a, a second order equation for, for u0, okay? Um, and we, we would get a pretty boring solution in this case. And so the point is that if we take this approach now, the heterogeneity is going to have no effect um, on, on the mean field, okay? 
So this whole exercise was basically to demonstrate to us that um, if we have periodic inhomogeneities and we just sort of try and average them out uh, directly, then we're going to miss something. We're going to miss something about the impact that that uh, periodic diffusion has on the dynamics um, of our of our solution. Okay, um, we're not even really looking at dynamics in this case, um, but uh, but you know basically this tells us that at the level of the mean field, okay, averaging uh, will will sort of shroud the the effects of, of periodic diffusion. Okay. So if we want to do things like um, augment the, the, the traveling wave speed and the traveling wave problem, what we have to do is uh, alter this method in order to make it work well for um, uh, the full uh, bistable equation with inhomogeneity. Okay? But one thing that I will note is that if we go back to the, the previous slide, what we find is that the um, the um, I think I can get a pointer here. Can I get a pointer? What we find is that the u uh, one expression that we have really suggests a specific form for our perturbation expansion. So if we go to um, what now we would suggest as the form of our perturbation expansion, we see that um, it, it should involve something like our periodic inhomogeneity multiplied by the partial derivative of, of u0 with respect to the microscale. Okay, so this we got through uh, that one step of averaging. So we will use one result from averaging in our perturbation expansion, okay? But we won't uh, average everything out in, in terms of the, the primary PDE, okay? So what would we want to look for in terms of the effects of heterogeneity on um, the solutions to the PDE? One effect could be that in a limit of very strong heterogeneity, we don't have any propagation at all, but waves get pinned in place, okay? And Keener uh, goes through that analysis. Okay, and um, I, I have some handwritten notes on that that I can send as well, but we'll not cover that here. I really want to focus on, um, in, in the limit of sort of weaker heterogeneity, how uh, this heterogeneity can slow uh, the velocity of waves, okay, and, and actually compute this correction. So let's go back to our um, original inhomogeneous uh, bistable equation. Again, our diffusion coefficient is going to involve 1 over 1 plus this periodic inhomogeneity. Okay. What are our initial conditions in this case? It turns out they don't really matter that much okay? because for any initial conditions, uh, eventually if this traveling uh, wave-like solution is attracting, then the dynamics will approach that. Okay. And we're just assuming that that's what's going to happen, although I'm not going to prove that to you. What are the bound relevant boundary conditions? Well, really, we have sort of free boundaries, um, but we can just make an assumption that uh, the uh, spatial derivatives of u approach zero as we go out towards um, in infinity. Okay. So, um, in uh, in the limit uh, of of small uh, inhomogeneities. Okay. So we could try applying the averaging theorem to this. And there's a nice book by uh, Jim Keener called Principles of Applied Math where he uh, writes this out. I'll just sort of copy that here. And the, the, the classical averaging theorem says that if I have some differential equation of the following form, okay, the, I'm just going to take a first order nonlinear differential equation to demonstrate this point. You can generalize this to PDEs. And it involves some nonlinear function of u, um, some function of x on the microscale, and maybe some, some function of uh, epsilon. Um, and epsilon is small. 
There is some change of variables where you can take u and re-express it as y plus epsilon times some function of y, where y is a function of x, and x on the microscale and epsilon. And you can rewrite that ODE as this first order average system, okay? Which is what we did on the previous slides, where f of zero is just basically what happens when you, when you average out over the microscale specifically when you average over the, over the microscale, okay? Now, this only is going to work if our system or solutions are structurally stable, which we said at the beginning, our traveling fronts are not. There are heteroclinics between two saddles, and so they're very fragile, and so the phase plane is not um, structurally stable, or the solutions that we're interested in, so we're going to forego sort of doing this sort of standard averaging approach that I went through with the steady state heat equation, and we'll just examine the, the full problem, okay, not just this reduced problem that we've written down now. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll start by rewriting the, the full partial differential equation up here, okay, as um, the, the following system. So, so what am I doing here? Really, I'm just taking... Um, F, I'm moving it over to the left side and I'm flipping the, the, um, the, the sides so that we just have our diffusion uh, term here on the left is equal to U sub T minus F of U, okay? But if I say that, well, let's just express U sub X, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll express uh, a new variable V in terms of U sub X. V times one plus g prime of x over epsilon equals u sub x. So then if I uh, differentiate v, that's the same as differentiating u sub x divided by one plus g prime of x over epsilon, okay? And then that will uh, be equal to ut equals f of u, okay? So I'm just sort of um, uh, taking a page out of the book of sort of converting second order systems to phase plane systems, but doing it for this, this PDE system, okay? So this will just make our, our calculations a little bit smoother. And remember I said our previous calculations suggest that up to order um, epsilon, we should expand u in terms of um, some function y uh, plus epsilon v times g of x over epsilon. Okay, so, um, so let's plug this perturbation expansion here now into our rewritten system of PDEs here. And we get that Y sub X now is equal to V minus epsilon V sub X, G of X minus epsilon, uh, X over epsilon. And we have an equation V sub X equals Y sub T now. We have this partial derivative plus epsilon v t g of x over epsilon minus now the, the nonlinearity f, okay? So we're ignoring terms of order um, epsilon squared and above, and now we're just gonna handle this system, okay? So we've done a bit of perturbation theory um, already by uh, introducing this, this small parameter, okay? We're going to now, um, make a key assumption, which will be important for estimating our, our wave speed as it depends on the inhomogeneity. Specifically, we're gonna say that, recall the, the standard traveling wave coordinate for a traveling wave solution would be X minus CT, okay? But the important thing here is that the inhomogeneity is sort of sometimes going to slow down the wave and sometimes going to speed it up, okay? If you're in the patch where the diffusion coefficient is lower, the wave may go slower. If you're in a patch where the diffusion coefficient is higher, the wave may go faster, okay? And, and specifically, I mean, where the leading edge of that traveling wave is, okay? So it's gonna sort of speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. So we need to be able to track that, and we do that using um, this function phi of t, okay? So our new traveling wave coordinate now is, is going to sort of absorb this, this time-dependent function phi of t, okay? 
And so if we plug that into our phase planish looking system from the last page, we have this equation here for y and this equation for v. And in particular, we're going to seek perturbative solutions, okay? So it may now look like I've sort of averaged out the effects of the inhomogeneity, but hidden now in this traveling wave coordinate xi is the effect of the inhomogeneity in the form of this function phi of t. So the main player in this game that we, that we want to try and uncover is phi of t. What is phi of t? We need some sort of method for extracting what phi of t is, okay? We really only want to find out um, some scalar quantities about these solutions. We don't necessarily want to solve for, you know, the full form and shape of these perturbed traveling front solutions. We just want to know how much the, the front is slowed down or sped up by inhomogeneities. Okay, so, uh, so now Xi is sort of uh, absorbing the, these effects. So, so we, we have managed to sort of sneak in the effects of these inhomogeneities to our zeroth order uh, terms here, Y0 and V0. And then at order epsilon, we have this Y1 and, and V1, which we don't really want to solve for, but we want to sort of use them in order to uncover what, what phi of t is. And phi of t, what's phi of t? Well, to, to zeroth order, it's just, its derivative is going to be c, because it would be like ct. And to um, uh, order epsilon, we're going to have some function phi 1 prime of t. Okay, and then we don't really care about over order epsilon squared. We could go to higher order, but um, most of the interesting conclusions are going to happen at, at order epsilon. Okay, so what happens to the zeroth order equations? Well, we just recover the standard traveling wave solution, okay, as, as well we should. And we know how to solve that. We, we solved that on the, on the second slide of this talk. You can look back for that. Um, it's just going to be some traveling front solution that's going to have some shape uc of xi. So it's going to be, you know, like monotone decreasing in, in xi. It's going to go from 1 down to, down to 0, and v0 is just its derivative. Okay. Now, first order, we have this equation for y1 and v1 that involves these um, inhomogeneous right-hand sides. Okay. And um, I, I guess if you've managed to get through two-thirds of an asymptotics course, I would hope that uh, one thing that eventually pops into your mind is that uh, this is set up well to apply Fredholm alternative, right? We, we have something that we know what it is on the right-hand sides of these equations. We know all of the things on the right-hand sides of the equations, okay? And... Um, uh, well, up to, I guess, uh, uh, phi, but, uh, but we know everything else on the right-hand sides. And we have a linear operator on the left-hand sides, right? Linear operator in, in y1 and, and v1, okay? So Fredholm alternative. We want to apply the Fredholm alternative. What does that tell us? It tells us basically to ensure a bounded solution, okay, to this uh, first-order equation, we should require that the null space of the adjoint of the linear operator, okay, defining the left-hand side, should be orthogonal to the right-hand side of this equation, Fredholm alternative. That's how we sort of climb this hierarchy of uh, order epsilon equations, okay? Well, we only need to climb one rung, it'll just be the, the order epsilon equations, okay? What's our adjoint system? Well, we just, the, you take the adjoint, of the linear operator, you can see here that you have a, a minus v1 here that shows up as this minus one term here. We have um, we have a f prime y of zero here that shows up as a f prime y of zero over here. Okay, uh, the the minuses that would be in front of all of this go away if you do the integration by parts to get the adjoint, and the on uh, diagonal terms are zero and c here. Okay, so this is our adjoint. It turns out you, you can figure out what f prime of y0 is just by um, looking at the v0 equation, rearranging things, and plugging in what v0 is, okay? And then the v1 star equation is, uh, is not hard, okay? And it turns out you can, you can work this out on your own. Um, it, it, it may be tucked into the Keener paper somewhere. Um, that the, the 
null space of this adjoint equation is e to the c xi okay, times the vector minus u c prime prime uh, u c prime. Okay, so that's explicitly calculable. That's nice. Okay, so you know we just have to apply Fred Holm alternative. Essentially, take this null space and take its inner product with the right hand sides uh, of these equations. Okay, so this pairs up with this. Okay, and we we can figure out what v zero uh, prime is. It's just it's just this here. Okay. Um, and we take this e to the c uh, xi uh, u c prime. We take the product of that with this, and then we sum these together. Okay, and um, and if we move the phi one prime of t term over to the left hand side of that equation, saying that that you know dot product or inner product is zero, then we end up. Uh, with the following longish equation uh, for phi one prime of t, which is the only thing that we um, uh, don't know in the system up to uh, phi. Okay, so uh, we can uh, simplify this a bit, basically by um, uh, noticing that the product rule allows us to. Uh, make this this uh, this set of terms a little bit more compact, okay? And then if we integrate that right hand side by uh, parts, and we we isolate uh, the phi uh, one prime, or just to order epsilon, we can call that just phi prime. Then at order epsilon, we have d phi uh, dt equals c minus now this function, okay, uh, which we'll call capital phi, okay? So um, this is still non-trivial. It's actually a non-linear differential equation for phi because you see phi is tucked up in here. But I will show you an example where we can explicitly solve this in the case of piecewise linear dynamics, okay? So at this point, yeah, you still have something that maybe you would have to solve numerically, but it's uh, way simpler than coding, coding up, you know, some sort of uh, finite element in order to find out uh, your uh, solution to that full nonlinear PDE system. And we, we get some insight here into uh, what, what happens with uh, the, the speed of the wave. In particular, if this function phi, capital phi, okay, ever has amplitude above C, you should expect pinning of your wave, or you should roughly predict pinning, because, because if phi, d phi dt becomes zero, then you, you stop, you get, you get to this fixed point, okay? So if capital phi is large enough, propagation failure occurs, okay? But in, in order to really take a closer look at this um, equation that we've derived, let's look at a calculable case, okay? I want to also note that um, this is a, f a fairly simple equation that we've managed to uh, extract from uh, a, a, a longish, you know, uh, a set of calculations. Um, and and again, everything in this uh, function phi, except for uh, little phi, uh, we can compute, or we have access to to computing. Okay, one way or another. Okay, so let's look at a case where we get actually a, a, a fairly clean solution, the case of piecewise linear dynamics. So you might say, well, that um, has issues of uh, continuity, but we can, we can compute all our solutions explicitly in this case, okay? So in the case of piecewise linear dynamics, our nonlinearity is just gonna have a step right here, okay? So that we have a zero at uh, zero, we have a zero at one, and then we sort of have this zero um, at alpha, Okay, but we have, just have a discontinuity that, re that really be, is going to behave like um, a zero as far as we're concerned. And um, it's, it's not hard, actually, to explicitly derive solutions to the traveling wave uh, equation. Um, again, uh, you, you uh, should have worked this out in exercises in the PDE course. Um, there there are uh, uh, 
related ways of, uh, of, of doing this, I think, sort of laid out in exercises in Mark, Michael Shearer's book. And, uh, and the idea is that your, your traveling front solution is going to have some um, just exponential decaying term for xi greater than zero and some exponentially saturating term for xi less than zero. And you can work out those eigenvalues because you just have the piecewise linear um, equation when you go to the phase plane. Okay? And note that um, if you require continuity of the derivative across xi equals zero, this is going to give you an implicit equation for the wave speed c. Okay? So if we plug in lambda plus and lambda minus, okay, we get this uh, sort of longish uh, 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 rational uh, equation. Okay? We can cancel some things out. And we get an implicit equation for C in terms of alpha, okay? But uh, we can rearrange things again, and we end up with uh, just a quadratic equation that we can solve for C in terms of alpha, okay? So you see here, if alpha is a half, then the uh, wave speed slows to zero, okay? If alpha goes to zero, the, the wave speed diverges to infinity, okay? And uh, for, for C sort of between zero and a half, you have forward moving waves of, uh, of speed between zero, zero and infinity, okay? And so this means that this, this little term here on the bottom, okay, we can uh, solve for straightforwardly, we get this very compact expression for the, for the denominator of the capital Phi formula, okay? And now let's take a specific function for g. Let's, let's take the, the function g prime of x equals just a sinusoid. Okay, so we have sinusoidal variation in the uh, diffusion coefficient. If we plug that into our uh, expression for the integral in the numerator of capital Phi, we can uh, compute that integral and we get actually some terms involving epsilon squared but we really only want to preserve the ones at um, uh, order epsilon. So to order epsilon, actually, we end up with um, a, an extremely compact expression, okay, which just ends up being d phi dt equals c plus, and now this is our capital phi. It's just epsilon a over two cosine of uh, phi over epsilon. So what does that tell us? It tells us that uh, for as, as, as we move along, Okay, in, in phi, so for some values of phi, the speed of the wave is actually gonna be faster than c. For other values of phi, where, where cosine's negative, the speed of the wave is gonna be less than, um, less than c, okay? And in particular, if, um, if epsilon a over two, the amplitude of this sort of modulator of our instantaneous wave speed gets to be greater than c, then we get pinning. So we basically, in that limit, um, phi eventually will hit a fixed point and uh, the wave will just get stuck, okay? So as long as phi prime is greater than zero though, we can actually average this to get an average wave speed. So now, now the only other sort of piece of averaging that we've done in this equation is to say, well, um, as long as this right-hand side is always positive, the, the wave or, or wave-like structure is gonna to continue to move along. Let's find out what its average speed is over a period of the microstructure, okay? Two, two pi over epsilon. How long does it take to, for it to move two pi, two pi epsilon, okay? We integrate over a phi from zero to two pi over epsilon, two pi epsilon, excuse me, um, just, just using a sort of separation uh, of variables of our nonlinear differential equation. This is a computable integral, uh, which gives us two pi epsilon over square root of c squared minus epsilon squared a squared over four. So then the average speed, uh, the ratio between the average speed and c is this, one minus uh, epsilon a over two c whole thing squared. So that means that even though the, the wave speeds up and slows down, speeds up and slows down, it turns out that the net effect is, of the heterogeneity is to slow down the wave, okay, over time. So that means that as we increase the amplitude of the heterogeneity, okay, then as this, the heterogeneity gets stronger and stronger and stronger, 
or the microstructure gets wider and wider and wider, this is eventually going to reduce okay, the average speed of the wave and will eventually cause the, the wave to fail. Okay, the, 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 the wave will, will no longer continue to propagate. It's not going to die, it's just going to sort of freeze in place and not propagate. Okay, And so it turns out you can calculate this nicely for um, other examples, uh, such as the cubic nonlinearity. Uh, the formulas are not quite as clean as piecewise linear dynamics, but uh, Keener goes through them in that in that paper. Okay, and just to conclude now, what what have we showed? Well, that really just direct averaging that ignores the fact that uh, heterogeneity is going to modulate the wave speed will not properly reveal the effects of of inhomogeneities on the propagation of waves. So what we had to do was actually to incorporate the effects of heterogeneity into the, the, the wave characteristic itself. Okay, so we, we, had to, we had to express sort of the traveling wave coordinate in terms of uh, this, this non-trivial function phi of t, which we solved for uh, using the order epsilon hierarchy and um, the Fred Holm alternative. Okay, and our perturbative equations uh, give us this nice rough estimate for wave pinning as well as sort of how much increasing the amplitude or the micro scale of the heterogeneity will uh, slow down the wave. And typically it's, it's always going to uh, uh, slow down the wave in this case. Okay, so I'm uh, giving uh, Mark a, a short homework exercise where you can sort of explore working through this um, in another system. And, um, and you can even uh, push on and, and, and compute things explicitly um, in that case as well. And I'll, I'll give you another paper by uh, Paul Bresloff that um, goes through that. Um, but that's it for uh, asymptotics of uh, traveling waves in, in, in homogeneous media. Uh, thank you.